Hi, welcome to our presentation from Tom Just. I'm Peter Bergen, a Vice President at New America. Uh, Tom and I uh, teach a course together at Arizona State in the um, MA in Global Security. Um, and uh, Tom has a new book out, which is Combating Anti-Semitism in Germany and Poland, Strategies Since 1990, uh, which he's going to talk about in momentarily. Tom is a assistant teaching professor within the Future Security Initiative at Arizona State. Prior to that, he was uh, a postdoctoral fellow at Northern Arizona University, and he taught a number of courses also at the University of Georgia. Uh, and uh, he got interested in the subject when he was working in Poland at the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, that's how he first uh, kind of got interested in this, this book uh, subject. So I'm going to hand it over to Tom, and then we'll have a Q&A, and then I'll also um, moderate questions that come in from the audience, which is through the Slido app. So, Professor Just, um, take it away. All right, thanks, Peter, and welcome, everyone. As you know, the title of my book is Combating Anti-Semitism in Germany and Poland, Strategies Since 1990. And I'll just start off by going over a brief overview of what's included in the book. So uh, I start off in the introductory chapter by defining the term anti-Semitism, which is much more difficult than I think many people realize. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll mention briefly uh, what, what my definition is um, shortly after I, I go over the outline. So um, in, the, in the first section of the book, I talk about the problem of anti-Semitism in both Germany and in Poland, uh, historically as well as in more modern times. Uh, and then I look at the strategies to counter the problem in both countries, which is kind of where my interest was peaked um, during my time within Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So my, my supervisor during my time there was the special envoy to the Jewish diaspora, which was a position that I did not know existed uh, prior to my time there. Um, but I got to learn firsthand about some of the initiatives that Poland has put in place in terms of uh, reaching out to Jewish communities domestically and abroad and combating anti-Semitism. Uh, and then the book concludes by looking at the effectiveness of these strategies within each of these countries and also looks at some of the new challenges that have arisen in recent years. Um, so to the, the definition of anti-Semitism, so you may be familiar with the variety of definitions that are out there from uh, different organizations, um, but the definition that, that I came up with is hostile attitudes or attacks targeting Jewish people, symbols, or interests based on religious, economic, racial, or political grounds. Um, and the reason that I developed this definition is that from the others that I, I read, they allude to different manifestations of anti-Semitism, but don't explicitly state what those are, uh, which is why I included these four adjectives um, to kind of categorize these different manifestations of anti-Semitism. So the first is religious anti-Semitism, which is the oldest form and dates all the way back to antiquity. Uh, and this is really the perceived refusal of Jews to adopt majority religious and social customs. Uh, and as Christianity developed, this came to include things like deicide, so the belief that Jews are responsible for the killing of Christ, and blood libel, the belief that Jews will kidnap Christian children and use their blood and religious rituals, um, which surprisingly more people believe that today than, than you may think. Um, and I'll show some of the, the data on that a bit later. Uh, and then we have economic anti-Semitism, which really arose during the Middle Ages, and this involves stereotypes of Jews as being greedy, dishonest, wealthy, and exploiting Christian debtors. Um, and it arose during this time period because Christianity had a prohibition on usury, so charging interest on loans. And because of that, a number of Jews moved into those occupations, in part because Christians around Europe believed that Jews were already damned. So they could fill those occupations without as much consequence. Next, we have racial anti-Semitism, which I find to be the most dangerous form and is really a combination of ethnic nationalism and pseudosciences like eugenics. So here's where you get things like Nazi racial science from. And the belief here is that Jewish blood and not only beliefs are inferior. Uh, so this was a major driver uh, leading toward the Holocaust. And then we have political anti-Semitism, which is the belief that Jews seek illegitimate political control. Uh, it includes things like Holocaust denial and Zionist conspiracy theories. Uh, and when I say Holocaust denial, that doesn't necessarily just mean saying the Holocaust did not happen. Um, but also minimizing the Holocaust, saying that the numbers are inflated, accusing Jews of conspiring for Zionist aims and perpetrating the Holocaust, and so forth. Uh, so those are some of the major aspects of political anti-Semitism. Now getting into some of the particulars in each of these countries. Uh, so a lot of the book focuses on the far right in each country, um, because 
as you'll see in, in the data in Germany, um, over 80% of anti-Semitic violent attacks are committed from the far right, and over 90% of overall anti-Semitic crimes come from the far right. Um, now, the dynamics of the far right in these countries, um, so there's usually um, some parties on the fringes, like the NPD, the National Democratic Party in Germany, Republicaner is another one, um, that are founded on basically neo-Nazi, ultra-nationalist ideologies, um, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, uh, but these parties typically have very little support in, in, the, in the greater scheme of things. So typically 2% or less in, in federal elections. And because of that, they've never held federal seats in Germany. Um, and a, it's a similar dynamic in Poland as well, where you have some parties on the fringes, like the National Radical Camp, Falanga, uh, which actually existed in the 1930s, but then was revived in the 90s. Um, but in Poland, the push is typically for Catholic nationalism. Um, so trying to, to create a Catholic state at the expense of others. So they'll have things in their platforms like expelling Jews from society and so forth. But one of the things we've seen in recent years is a rise of what are kind of considered more mainstream far-right parties like the AFD, the Alternative for Germany, um, where you have a segment of the party which holds very stringent anti-Semitic beliefs, um, but it's not necessarily representative of, of the entire party. Um, so the AFD will oftentimes do things like exploit tensions between Muslim and Jewish migrants in the country. Um, and the AFD has been much more electorally successful than the other parties that I mentioned, like the NPD, in that the AFD uh, in 2017 obtained 13% of the seats in the German Bundestag, which is the third most of any party in the country. They dipped a bit in the 2021 elections, but are expected to grow their percentage in the upcoming elections next year. So opinion polls for next year are somewhere around 18, 20% for the AFD. Um, so they're likely to grow. And they've actually held seats in all 16 of the German states, unlike the other parties. The NPD had held seats in, in two German states. The AFD has held seats in all of them. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is the, the support for parties like the NPD have, have declined in recent years, uh, and that's because a lot of their membership has flocked toward the AFD, seeing that as a more successful avenue for their beliefs. Um, and we've seen similar things in Poland as well within major parties like the Law and Justice Party, um, which was in power until just last year. And you have a number of anti-Semitic statements from leadership in the party, their deputy leader was quoted as saying in a radio interview that he believes the protocol is L L Protocols of the Elders of Zion could be real, um, which is an anti-Semitic hoax document. Um, you have a senator from Law and Justice saying that Polish Jews are represented by the Knesset and not the Polish parliament, so playing into the dual loyalty trope. Um, there's also been some legislation passed by Law and Justice. Um, some of you may be familiar with the 2018 Holocaust Law, um, which really kind of criminalizes a lot of uh, speech about Poles who were collaborators during the Holocaust, and we can get into that maybe a bit during the Q&A. Uh, so now to some of these strategies in these two countries. So there's really two major aspects to the strategies. And the first are legal measures, and the second involves public diplomacy. And I use that term a bit differently than you may be familiar with, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so the legal measures include things like penalties for hate speech, incitement, Holocaust denial, which is banned in each of these two countries, um, granting Judaism full legal status. And in Germany, an important aspect uh, are some reforms to their immigration policies to allow Jewish immigration to the country as a means to help rebuild communities that were lost during the Holocaust. And then with public diplomacy. So public diplomacy, when you hear that term, it oftentimes means communication with publics abroad. And that is part of the strategy here, uh, but there's also a domestic component to it when you're tackling an issue like anti-Semitism. So if you think about Poland and Germany and the legacy of the Holocaust in those two countries, each of these countries want to portray the image that they have uh, progressed and that they've reconciled with these aspects of their history. So uh, part of this can involve things like working with NGOs to counter far right and other extremist groups, increasing education efforts, helping integrate Jewish migrants, uh, helping fund the preservation of Jewish cultural sites, establishing museums dedicated to Jewish heritage, and also focusing on common connections between the country and its Jewish history, uh, which is especially important in the Polish case, given that Poland, prior to World War II, had the world's largest Jewish community um, at about three and a half million. Today, it's only about, around 10,000, so um, much smaller, but it, it it's worth noting that Poland actually had a Jewish community uh, for as long as they've had Christians in the country. 
um, or in the lands that that form modern Poland. Um, so over a thousand years, dating back to the 10th century, you've had Jews and Christians living together on Polish territory. Uh, now some of the particulars in each of the countries. So in Germany, you have legal measures like restrictions placed on Nazi expression. So Nazi symbols, speech, music, et cetera. Um, the German police actually created an app called Nazi Shazam, where they can detect banned far-right music at rallies, which I thought was an interesting uh, tidbit. Uh, Germany has also, as I mentioned, loosened immigration restrictions for Jews, many of whom have come from the post-Soviet space, uh, which has drastically increased the population from the early 90s. So in 1990, you had about 30,000 Jews in Germany. Uh, by 2012, it was over 100,000 and grown slightly since then, although still uh, relatively stable because uh, they've rolled those those the loosening back a bit because of, of complaints by Israel. Um, because in the early 2000s, there were actually more Jews emigrating to Germany than to Israel. Um, Germany's also granted Judaism full legal status, which has enabled greater funding and resources and security for Jewish communities. Uh, now to the, the public diplomacy initiatives in Germany. So uh, collective guilt was a major motivator in the German case and in trying to change perceptions of the country and reconcile with these darker aspects of the country's history. Um, so this was done to change international perceptions abroad and to some extent domestically as well. Uh, the German foreign ministry played a major role as part of this. And around the turn of the century, identified civil society engagement as being essential to uh, Germany's public diplomacy more generally. And this included uh, engaging with NGOs. Uh, one of them that I highlight is called Exit Deutschland, which helps to remove people from a far-right lifestyle. Um, so it, it will help with things like security for those who have removed themselves. Um, it was actually founded by a former member of a far-right group. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting organization that does receive governmental support. Um, and to date, they've helped remove over 800 people from far-right groups with only a 3% recidivism rate. So it's been fairly successful. You also have the establishment of, of Jewish memorials and museums across the country and the restoration of synagogues. The number of synagogues is still far less than it was prior to World War II, but it's grown over the last few decades. Uh, Germany also recently has uh, developed a national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. And this was adopted in the fall of 2022, so fairly recent. You had these different aspects of a strategy already in place for, for decades, uh, but they finally put this in writing as a cohesive national strategy uh, just two years ago. Um, although a bit further back in 2018, they created the position of the commissioner for Jewish life in Germany in the fight against anti-Semitism. So this is the person who led the charge to uh, create that national strategy. And it includes things like improving data collection, developing education efforts, establishing punishments and providing security for anti-Semitic acts, and also bolstering Jewish life within the country. Um, it's no worth noting that the U.S. actually adopted a very similar strategy last May, um, and you had a delegation from the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, that arrived in Germany and met with Germany's Jewish life commissioner to discuss these strategies. So it was shortly after Germany had adopted theirs, and the U.S. basically copied many aspects of it and put those into its own strategy about six months later. Uh, now to the Polish case. So in Poland, you have legal measures that are a bit different in Germany. So both of these countries have strategies to combat anti-Semitism, but they developed largely independent of one another. There's been very little cooperation between the two countries. And in Poland, they have this unique aspect, which is, is called the Institute of National Remembrance, which is essentially a think tank, which is geared toward uh, determining the facts of Nazi and communist crimes within the country, but it also has prosecutorial powers. So this is the institute that can prosecute people for Holocaust denial, for instance. Poland has been a bit more restrictive in their immigration laws, so they haven't had the same goal as Germany in terms of trying to rebuild Jewish communities, which is why you have a much smaller population today. Um, but Poland has granted Judaism full legal status, so a lot of the same benefits that Jewish communities receive in Germany, um, they also receive in Poland through increased funding and support. Uh, Poland also has various public diplomacy initiatives, and these began really around the early 2000s when Poland was uh, a candidate for EU membership. So at this time, Poland conducted a survey across Europe to see what other Europeans thought of Poland, and the number one stereotype of Poles was that they're anti-Semitic. 
Um, so this was a major emphasis in their public diplomacy campaign to try to change that perception. Um, and they tried to do things like correct mischaracterizations of the country's history. So um, they, the foreign ministry created a website called Against Polish Camps, um, which would correct media outlets who would use phrases like Polish death camps and so forth and, and correct them and state that they were Nazi German concentration camps. Um, those may seem like small things, but they do um, lead into these stereotypes that people had of Poland. Um, their campaign expanded after EU membership and became what's known as a nation branding campaign. So a major part of this was having domestic engagement through cultural exchanges, dialogical forums, which are often geared toward discussing various Polish heroes during the Holocaust, righteous Gentiles, people who helped Jews, um, and also focusing on a common identity between uh, Poles and Jews which has in part led to a revival of domestic Jewish culture within the country. So we've seen increased support for Jewish festivals, community centers, museums like the Poland Museum in Warsaw, for instance. All right, now looking at whether or not these, these measures have actually been effective. So there are a few indicators that I look at to see whether or not these, these strategies have actually been working. Uh, the first is membership in far-right groups, then attitudes toward Jews within the country, uh, belief in anti-Semitic myths, anti-Semitic crimes committed, and then the current state of the domestic Jewish community. So in terms of membership in far-right groups, in Germany, we've seen a decline since the early 1990s. Um, so between about 1993 and 2014, membership in German far-right groups dec decreased by about two-thirds, um, which was quite significant. But over the last six or seven years, we've seen an increase again. Um, and since 2014, the increase in, in German far-right group membership has increased by about 40%. Um, so that's concerning and is something to watch moving forward. However, general anti-Semitic attitudes in Germany have declined since the early 2000s. Um, so how they measure this is they, they conduct surveys where they ask people a series of questions. Um, for, for instance, if you uh, believe that Jews are a nefarious force in society, and there are typically three questions, and if somebody answers yes to all three, they're deemed manifestly anti-Semitic. Um, so those numbers have declined from about 9.5% in 2022 to 3.5% in 2022. Um, so they've declined over that period of time. However, we have seen an increase in xenophobic attitudes in the country. So that's something that's concerning and is uh, does have impacts on the Jewish community because the majority of German Jews today have an immigrant background. Um, so xenophobia and anti-Semitism are often linked, and we see this in modern conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement Theory, for instance. If we look at anti-Semitic crime in Germany, um, that's fluctuated over the years. However, in the last five years or so, we've seen some new high points in Germany. So 2022 actually had the highest number of anti-Semitic violent attacks in the country. 2021 had the highest number of overall anti-Semitic crimes, which includes property crimes. Um, and the Ministry of Interior actually breaks down the ideologies of the perpetrators. Um, and this is where we have the data that 80% of anti-Semitic violent attacks are committed by the far right and 90% of all anti-Semitic crimes. Um, so the strategies tend to be focused on the far right for that reason in that they're committing the vast number of crimes. Um, switching to Poland, here we've also seen general anti-Semitic attitudes decline. So in the early 90s, 93, you had more than 50% of the Polish population responding that they had antipathy toward Jews. Um, that's decreased by about half since that period of time. Although the time period where we began to see decreases was 2005, which is when this public diplomacy campaign really began to kick in. And 2008 was the first year where we actually had more sympathy toward Jews than antipathy in the country. The, the numbers have kind of leveled off since that period of time. Um, so the numbers aren't necessarily great, um, but they have improved since the 90s. However, one area where we have seen an increase is in anti-Semitic myths. So belief in deicide, belief in blood libel, these things have actually increased over the last 15 years or so. Um, and economic anti-Semitism has increased as well, especially since the Great Recession in 2008. So you have surveys saying that more than 50% of Poles since that time believe that Jews have too much economic influence in society. Now, the crime data in Poland is a bit more scattered um, since Polish police have only been required since 2016 to take down an anti-Semitic motive if a crime is committed. 
Um, so we have a very small sample size in terms of uh, the hate crime data in Poland. So it's something that we can't really glean much from at this point, uh, but it is worth watching moving forward. All right. Uh, and finally, I'll just leave you with some survey research of European Jews and their impressions of how countries combat anti-Semitism. So within Germany and Poland, so the, the last survey that we have data for is from 2018. There should be a 2023 data coming out later this year. Um, but in 2018, more than 50%, slightly more than 50% of German Jews reported experiencing anti-Semitic harassment in the last five years. It's just over 40% in Poland. Um, but within the 12 European countries they surveyed, the numbers were between 35 and about 55% for all the countries that were measured. So anti-Semitism remains a problem across Europe um, and, and still within these countries as well. All right. And then uh, what forums are these anti-Semitic comments and harassment um, being made? Overwhelmingly, the, the top forum is the Internet, um, which should not come as any surprise with 80 percent of Jews who reported experiencing harassment, experiencing some online. That doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't experienced it elsewhere uh, as well. Um, but the Internet is really the main area where we see anti-Semitic rhetoric very prevalent. Um, and a, part of the reason for that is it's so difficult to combat anti-Semitism online because of jurisdictional issues. Um, you know, if there's certain speech that's banned in, in Germany or Poland, somebody can create a website in the United States or Denmark or elsewhere and still access it in those countries. Um, and there's been very little coordinated strategy to combat it online. Some German states have developed strategies to combat anti-Semitism online, um, but there hasn't really been much implemented at this point. In fact, we had a, a member from the State Department on campus a couple of weeks ago um, who's in the Office for Combating Anti-Semitism, and I asked specifically about any initiatives they've encountered that have been successful for combating anti-Semitism online, and they basically told me that they're, they're handcuffed because of the First Amendment, um, and they, they didn't really give much insight into any sort of uh, strategies to combat it online. Um, and that's not really what I, I was getting at with my question. I, I think they were kind of trying to deflect in that I think there's much more that can be done by NGOs who don't have those sorts of restrictions. All right, and I do want to leave you with some good news uh, in that in both countries we've we've seen a Jewish revival over the last few years. So uh, it, these are this is characterized differently in each country, though. Um, so in Germany, you've seen an increase in the Jewish population. So from the 90s until about the 2010s, as I mentioned, it's more than tripled um, in Germany. Whereas in Poland, it's been more of a Jewish revival through expressions of Jewish culture. So you have events like the Krakow Jewish Culture Festival which uh, is attended by tens of thousands of people each year, most of whom are non-Jews. So you have a lot of non-Jews who are taking an interest in that part of the country's history and culture and its identity. Um, so I think I'll leave it there for uh, my part of the talk, and I look forward to the, the questions and, and discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you very much Tom. So one, one question I have, the, the anti-Semitism in Germany um, and the the AFD, the right wing party, that is a mostly Eastern Germany phenomenon, or how does it geographically sort of sort out? Yeah, that's where the AFD derives most of their support from, um, or the highest that, percentage of support. And is that related to? I mean, obviously, Eastern Germany for decades was you know essentially uh, a Soviet bloc country with a command economy. Is is the is the Eastern Germany economy, um, you know? still much below the western germany economy and what what are what are the what's the economics and politics of this phenomenon so the eastern german economy has significantly improved since the early 90s um however it's still a bit more agrarian in, in terms of its economy than in the west um so it's it's not as developed in many parts um and i think you know, and they historically have had much higher unemployment rates than in the West. So um, in cities in East Germany, I, I had studied there in, in 2007, 2008, um, and there were unemployment rates over 20 percent in many of the cities. Um, that's improved over the last few years, and you've seen a revival of some of these Eastern German cities. Um, the city of Leipzig, for instance, where, where I had lived, um, the population has increased just over the last 15 years by 100,000 people. Um, so that there the situation has improved in Eastern Germany. And one of the interesting things that I found is that levels of anti-Semitism in Eastern Germany typically are lower than in the West, which may come as a surprise. But if you look at the, the data on xenophobia, it's much higher in the former East. Um, so I think that's a lot of what's driving 
the AFD and a lot of these far right parties in the former East, um, especially since 2014 with the, the influx of Syrian refugees in the country. So, um, and if you look at the success of the AFD, some German states, so Saxony, for instance, the AFD is around 30%. They almost have a plurality in the state parliament there. Um, and they're expected to, to have that in the next elections. Um, so that's an area where they have been extremely successful. And I think xenophobia is driving a lot of that. Although, I mean, I remember at the time, Angela Merkel, who, of course, herself is East German, um, was, um, you know, there was, a, they, they took a million refugees from Syria, and there was a lot of, like, the sky is going to fall, and the sky is going to fall, and she's, you know, making a huge political mistake. But, I mean, broadly speaking, those immigrants seem to have been absorbed into Germany. You know, that's a lot of people in mm -hmm. a population of 60 million, a, a million come in. Uh, I mean, how do you kind of uh, score that? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the far right will certainly highlight incidents of, you know, a, a Syrian refugee attacked a German right. woman or, or things like this. And that's how they 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 gain a lot of their or a lot is a big part of their marketing um, and, and their yeah. branding to to much of the country. So I think, you know, and that's similar to, to far right groups elsewhere. Um, and a lot of the AFD's efforts have really been focused on Islamophobia and, like I said, trying to, to play different groups against each other. So the, the Muslim migrants and, and, and Jews within Germany. So basically, one of the things they'll do is they, they created a group called Jews in the AFD. And it's used as a way to deflect accusations of anti-Semitism away from the AFD to make it seem like a more mainstream party. Um, so they'll say that, you know, Islamist groups are the problem in the country. That's where the anti-Semitism is coming from. It's not on the far right, um, even though the crime data shows something very different within the country. And of course, um, Holocaust denial is a crime in Germany. It's not a crime in the United States or in many other countries, but, you know, because it's a First Amendment issues um but you know the the german um ex experience of the holocaust i think has created this kind of interesting dynamic with their diplomatic relations with israel in particular right now during the gaza war i mean how does it how has it complicated that diplomatic relationship between germany and israel yeah um Germany has been extremely supportive of Israel, especially over the last few months. And you heard um, there was a, a speech given by the, the vice chancellor, which went viral, um, where he was explaining Germany's reasons for supporting Israel um, and really Germany's uh, ways of, of dealing with the collective guilt um, since the Second World War. And uh, that, that's been a major issue. Since, and Germany, like I said, has been one of the most supportive countries of Israel over the last several months. Um, and there hasn't been as much attention paid to the Palestinian cause within the government um, because of that. So, uh, yeah, it's something that has certainly, and you saw just recently Nicaragua take Germany to the, the ICC um, and, and try to sue Germany for, for that support. So um, it's something that has caused some difficulties with Germany, not, not in terms of just with Israel, but abroad as well. And then in, in Poland, um... You, the the right wing party there is the the is that the justice party what is the law and justice law yeah and justice. yeah so I mean they were doing very well for many years haven't they sort of had a bit of a reverse of late yeah so they just lost um their their majority in the last elections in, in last October um and there there are a variety of reasons for that um one of the reasons is that you actually had the other parties um that are, are very disparate from one another join together to oppose the the law and justice so um it, it's a very fragile coalition currently that's against uh, law and justice and you've seen some of the leftist parties kind of competing with the, the civic platform which is the ruling party currently um so it's a fragile coalition i think that's something that the, the law and justice is going to try to exploit um before the the next elections and are they a sort of Orban-like party, which is sort of sort of anti-immigrant, sort of vaguely anti-Western, at least as defined by NATO and EU? Yeah, and, and they've actually been very friendly with Orban. There, there was certainly a rift um, since the start of the Ukraine war, whereas Poland has been much more supportive of Ukraine, of Ukraine regardless of which party has been in charge. Um, so both parties have wanted to boost Poland's defense spending and boost... Um, 
support for Ukraine, although you have seen some um, backlash to that support to Ukraine within Poland, especially when it comes to things like agricultural um, imports into the EU, um, where you had a blockade along the Polish border trying to block supplies getting into Ukraine. Um, and a lot of that is is from the far right and, and people who would normally be supportive of, of law and justice, um, which is kind of where the stronghold for the party is, is in eastern Poland, um, which is more toward that Ukrainian border. And what is the sort of Polish attitude to the Holocaust? Obviously, you know, Auschwitz is in Krakow, outside Krakow, and Poland played a outsized role in the, and Poles themselves, I think, you know, I mean, were either acquiescent or even um, helping the Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, and anti-Semitism in Poland has been, you know, longstanding pre-Nazi. Pre so what is their, the Polish view to the Holocaust, you know, what is their, how do they understand the Holocaust and how do they memorialize it or not? So I think one of the the problems with anti-Semitism in Poland is something that's called victimhood competition. So you oftentimes will have um, people seeing anti-Semit or the, the the victims of the Holocaust as a zero-sum game. So if you talk about the um, destruction of the Jewish community and the suffering of Jews within Poland, they'll say, "Why aren't you talking about the suffering of Poles?" Um, and that's where a lot of the anti-Semitism around the Holocaust stems from. There's a, a book that came out, I think maybe 20 years ago, about uh, called "The Crosses of Auschwitz," where you had Polish Catholics putting crosses outside of Auschwitz, and it grew to like 100 crosses that were put up outside the camp to me memorialize the Polish Catholic victims at Auschwitz. At Auschwitz, and many people saw this as a way to diminish the suffering of Jews. Um, and that's been a major a contention within the country um, over the last several decades. You mentioned uh, these programs to kind of pull people out of uh, right wing extremist groups. And you you kind of surprised me by saying the recidivism rate is pretty low. Mm -hmm. what, 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 I mean, what are these groups doing and why is it sort of relatively successful? I think one of the major aspects of it is removing people's social circles and essentially creating a new one through the group um, yeah. where, especially as those groups grow. Um, and and I think, think about that's really, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is really the same, right? The same formula. Yeah, it, wor it works basically the same sort of way. Um, and like yeah. I said, the group was founded by a, me a former member of a far right group, um, right. which I think is really helpful. And I think that's one area that hasn't really been used enough is um, groups like Exit Deutschland and perhaps using some of the expertise from people in those groups to counter the far right um, going forward. So I think that's, you know, one of the areas that can be successful, not in terms, not necessarily all, always in terms of them speaking out, because that's can be something that can be quite dangerous, um, for people who have removed themselves from those groups, that would certainly be a benefit. But I think being able to identify the, the major recruiting circles of these groups, especially as it pertains to the internet, um, I think there's a lot more expertise that can be used from former members of these groups, um, in those forums. And, you know, you mentioned the sort of international dimension to this. I mean, uh, you know, when if you look at an attack on a synagogue in Pittsburgh, you know, you know, as, as we had in this in this country, or you look at an attack on the mosque in Christchurch uh, in in New Zealand, where fifty one uh, Muslims were killed at, uh, you know, at a at a church, and or you look at Andres Breivik, the Norwegian sort of fascist who killed um dozens and dozens of people in norway i mean so to what extent are these um people inspired by these uh attacks or and or and or by their manifestos because usually they the perpetrators of these attacks usually leave a manifesto behind how and ha, you know and and you also mentioned the social media kind of kind of aspect i mean how do you uh to what extent are social media companies really able to kind of bring down anti-Semitic far-right material um, that contravenes their own terms of use, i.e. that they, 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 you know, it's one thing to have right-wing views or extreme right-wing views, but it's another thing to incite violence, and that is not allowed on any of these platforms, which are private spaces. They're not, you don't have a right to be on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, so I guess two parts of the question. One is, uh, you know, how internationalized is the phenomenon in terms of just people being inspired by attacks and manifestos from around the world and and secondly how can social medias or how would you rate their success or lack thereof in terms of pulling violent um anti-semitic or violent right-wing material off uh, their platforms 
Yeah, so in terms of the international elements, we've seen that in Germany. And I think one of the things that's really picked up in recent years is live streaming these attacks online. Um, yeah. So the Christchurch uh, shooter in, in New Zealand had done that. And about a year later, you had a, a, a shooter in Germany at, at a synagogue in the city of Halle who opened fire um, and was live streaming it as well. Um, he actually wasn't able to get in the synagogue because of the security, um, but he still went to a nearby shop and killed two people. Um, and I think one of the things to, to really make... Um, the issue of anti-Semitism, xenophobia, all these issues resonate more with people is to demonstrate that they're not just a threat to that one particular community. So, um, and I think that the, the shooting in Hala demonstrates that in that somebody had these anti-Semitic beliefs, they tried to attack a synagogue and yet they killed two others outside. Um, and we've seen that in the U.S. as well, um, you know, especially with the, the great replacement theory in recent years. So you mentioned the the shooting at the, the synagogue in, in Pittsburgh. Um, shortly after that, we had the, the shooting at the El Paso Walmart. Um, we had the Buffalo supermarket shooting, all targeting different groups. So you, were you saw attacks targeting Jews, Hispanics, African-Americans, um, all derived from this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Um, so I think that's another thing that we're these things have especially been able to spread. And, I, and we saw this during COVID um, as well, when people, you know, they were during lockdown, people would go online, they'd go down these rabbit holes. Um, and that's how a lot of these conspiracy th theories grew in recent times too. And we saw more of this international connection. And you saw groups that, you know, started in one country, but have grown and expanded in others, like QAnon, for instance, is something that's grown in Germany. And we saw QAnon protests in Germany, you know, during 2020, 2021. Um, so I think, that element, especially the, the online element, is something that's really grown and allowed for these, these copycat attacks to take place where somebody will idolize one of the, the previous mass shooters or somebody who carried out an attack, and then they'll try to do it themselves. And, and also, it works the other way. Interesting. I was talking to uh, Christine Abizade, who's the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, and she said the Buffalo attack, which was you know, conducted at a supermarket in a Black community, inspired an attack in Slovakia um so um it's not just people in the united states sort of absorbing other attacks attacks in the united states are inspiring other attacks elsewhere mm -hmm. um so the whole distinction between sort of international and domestic terrorism on the right i think is um yeah it, clearly this is a global a globalized movement and a, a set of ideas um and the great replacement theory takes lots of different forms but i mean if you were to define it how would you define it and it's different within different contexts. So in Europe, really, the belief is that wealthy Jews are behind funding refugees coming in from the Middle East. And here in the U.S. Well, by the way, just to interrupt, I mean, yeah. the, you mentioned the El Paso attack. Mm -hmm. You know, part of that was the idea that George Soros was funding the migrant caravans that were coming across Mexico at that time. Um, so, I mean, very similar. Yeah, and that, that was getting to my next point. So in the U.S., you often see that through migration from you know Central South America into the U.S. So it's different depending on which immigrant groups tend to be coming into these countries. Um, but it, it has that same root in that there's a group of elites, typically Jews, um, that are behind funding these things like, like George Soros. And George Soros is a name that comes up often within Europe as well. And we've seen that within Hungary um, under Orban. Um, oh, yeah. You know, where you've had the, the Central European University in Budapest has had to move out of Hungary into, into Vienna in recent years, um, which is, is funded in large part through Soros. Um, so you, you've had a lot of these same anti-Semitic attacks um, coming through this theory in Europe and, and in the U.S. If you and, have a question. and we've seen Orban speaking at far-right events here in the U.S. as well. So there's that common connection, too. Yeah. Um, and of course, he was just at Mar-a-Lago shortly discussing Ukraine and kind of um, you know what 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 happens next if Trump wins. Mm -hmm. um, if if the audience has questions, please put it in the slide Slido app. Um, so now in Poland, you have a you have a it, it's a sort of democratic, um, liberal sort of how would you define the government? I would still say it's somewhat center right. Um, the two major parties in Poland are, are a bit more to the right. It's it's more centrist. Um, you have law and justice, which is much more further to the right, and they've actually moved further and further to the right over the last couple decades. Because um, back in the early two thousands, you had uh, 
the, the law and justice party with power. And you had Lech Kaczynski, who was the president at the time, the identical twin brother of the current leader of the party. Um, he was the one who laid the cornerstone for the Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. And you had even the law and justice members buying into trying to reconcile with the past. Um, and you've seen the, the party move further to the right in recent years. Um, but yeah, and within Poland, you have more of these leftist parties that are joining with Civic Platform, which is more center right currently, is kind of a coalition against the more authoritarian influences of the, the Law and Justice Party. Um, so it's it's really a new, more fragile coalition, I would say. I mean, for um, the Holocaust is now for uh, a younger generation, um, an event that happened a, quite a long time ago. So in, in Germany, are you seeing uh, more kind of Holocaust denial amongst young people? And I mean, where where, where is this? And more anti-Semitism among young people. Where where is the majority of this sentiment sort of located when it comes to age? I think um, a great deal comes from social media, um, and that's especially true for younger generations. And we've seen that recently since the October seventh attacks on things like TikTok, where you have a lot of um, more pro-Hamas messaging coming through. And we saw this kind of surge in people praising Bin Laden because I mean, if you think about it, a lot of twenty-year-olds today they they were born after nine eleven. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of uh, missing context there and, and memories of, of these types of things by um, the younger generations. And you mentioned you were doing an article that kind of uh, comes out of that, uh, this new book. What, what is the article? Yeah, so um, it's in the early stages, but I, I'm looking at how um, anti-Semitic rhetoric has been reframed uh, with the rise of uh, groups like QAnon and, and the COVID conspiracy theories just over the past several years. Because um, as I mentioned, we've seen new high points in anti-Semitic crime, um, especially in Germany over the last few years. Um, so I want to take a look at how that rhetoric has shifted and how a lot of the uh, ancient and medieval aspects of anti-Semitism have morphed into these more modern conspiracy theories. And we see that with things like blood libel, for instance, uh, in, in QAnon, where you have you know this idea of the, these wealthy elites who are drinking the blood of children that comes from the, the medieval blood libel um, within Europe. So, I mean, it, back in the Middle Ages, it would be if if a Christian child would go missing, they would blame the Jews for kidnapping that child and taking and, and drinking their blood. Um, so I, I think a lot of a lot of this are, is just things that have been recycled over time. And this is something we've seen throughout history. A lot of these um, anti-Semitic manifestations have um, come up just in different forms over time. And I sit not far from where Comet Pizza is, which is where, of course, the QAnon, plus somebody who really believed that the Democratic Party were trafficking children. And um, at this particular pizza joint, he came armed with a rifle and sh shot a few times. Luckily, he didn't kill anybody. So uh, these theories can be, um, you know, they can lead to violence. But in, in terms of QAnon, you mentioned it was catching on in Germany. Why is that? Since part of the QAnon conspiracy also involves the idea that Trump We'll come back to power. It just seems like uh, how does it reinvent itself in a German context? I think it's just the general populist nationalism that's risen over the last several years um, and a lot of similar rhetoric uh, within the AFD, within, you know, elements with, here in the U.S., with, within Orban's government as well. I think it, it's similar and you have kind of this alliance of, of populist nationalists globally. Um, and I think that's where a lot of it stems from in that they see themselves as akin to one another. Yeah, but I mean, are they respond? Is it is it um, is it a, a sort of demand or a supply problem? By 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 which I mean, you know, the global financial crisis in two thousand eight sort of kind of um, did a lot to I think uh, undercut uh, elites and kind of uh, you know uh, the idea that elites had it under control, and then the massively botched COVID response in so many different countries in so many different ways, and so is that the kind of context of these kinds of populist beliefs um, or where 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 are they coming from? I think COVID has played into that um, for sure. And, and that's where we really saw QAnon gain a foothold in Germany was during the, the, the lockdowns. Um, and you had a lot of these anti-mask protests that were taking place in Germany. Um, and I think that's where a lot of it stems from during the, the, the COVID time. So you had uh, people coordinating with each other across borders online, um, organizing protests. And I think they they kind of feed off each other. And when they can say, you know, somebody here in the US can say, look at these protests in Germany and elsewhere. Um, and we have kind of this, this global kinship with one another. And I think it gives people kind of a sense of belonging in a more international context. And if 
people read the book and they can buy the book they can purchase the book uh, on the screen um you know what what are the sort of main takeaways that you would hope that they uh take so i think um so i lay out these different strategies that have happened that have um, been implemented in both of these two countries um and i think some of the things that i show are, are where these strategies have fallen short and where we can start to fill those gaps so i think um, if you look at general anti-Semitic attitudes in both countries, that's where we've seen a decline. Um, so that's where I think these strategies have been effective, but they've been much less effective in terms of trying to target those who are most fervent in their beliefs and willing to go commit crimes. And I think that's where there's a lot of room for growth in these strategies. Um, so I think um, the internet is one area where there hasn't been much done and where there's a lot of room to improve. Um, and I think there are some different strategies for doing that. I think that um, NGOs can be especially helpful in that realm because the, the people in government that I've talked to have basically said there's nothing they can do in that realm. Um, so I think NGOs doing things like something that's called political jamming. So using a lot of the, the sorts of memes and uh, doctored footage and things that that extremist groups will use and use that against them. Um, so to kind of penetrate these forums that don't have countering viewpoints within them. Um, so I think some of those areas where um, you, you have these gaps in the strategies are an area that can really be useful in, in, in defining where we need to improve moving forward and which areas of anti-Semitic and extremist groups more generally we need to target moving forward. And there's also quite a lot of um, a lot of this is post facto, but I mean there's a there's a whole um, discipline of threat management that didn't, but certainly in the United States that didn't exist maybe even 20, 30 years ago, which is we now have a bit, much better understanding of how people can go from a grievance to actually carrying out some kind of violent act, because typically they go through a, a very predictable process of grievance and ideation and then you know, uh, planning and then rehearsal and possibly, um, you know, doing a dry run and then carrying out the attack. So if you know that somebody's radicalizing, and obviously in this country, it's not a crime to be a radical. Mm -hmm. It is a crime, in, as we've discussed, to deny the Holocaust in Germany. It is a crime to incite racial violence in the UK. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what, what the laws are in other uh, European countries. But, um, you know, the question of how people come, from, you know, are sitting in their basement becoming radicalized uh that's a very large group of people a relatively small group of people are going to do something about it but the question is where do you intervene how do you intervene what interve what interventions are counterproductive what are what are productive and it sounds like i know from my own work in jihadism that you know one of the most effective ways to get somebody to stop um radicalizing is you know is a, is a former jihadist talking to somebody who is radical uh because they've been through the process uh but you know that's all also very labor intensive and some people won't be some people won't be deterred yeah in some of the groups um so uh, we have uh, obviously a lot of lone wolf people who will go out and, and commit these sorts of attacks but there are also a number of people who belong to these very small groups online that may only consist of 20 30 40 people um, mm -hmm. they will all kind of feed off of each other and radicalize one another. And I think one of the issues is um, identifying those forums that that people are in, um, where there's really no sort of penetration of counter narratives or any sort of alternative thinking. Um, and I think perhaps having former members of those groups being able to identify where people are being radicalized online and elsewhere um, can be something that that's really useful um, in being able to target messaging and counter narratives and try to sort of penetrate this bubble that these extremists will often be in where they're feeding off of each other without any sort of outside influence because they, the, the the most extreme people are typically are not on Twitter or Instagram or these major social media sites. They're on corners of the web that most average people will have no idea even exist. Um, so I think being able to identify those will be one of the most effective ways in countering online anti-Semitism, xenophobia, other sorts of hatred. Yeah, and I mean, that raises a very good point, which is, uh, you know, Telegram is, you know, Telegram is it used to be based in Berlin, I think, and now it's based in Dubai. So it's just not subject to um, European laws or American laws or Western laws or Western customs. And maybe Telegram is better now that typically these platforms kind of start with the view that no one should tell them what to do and that basically, you know, anything goes. And then over time, they, they mature. I think you're not, we may have seen a bit of the reverse now with Twitter. Now that Elon Musk is in charge, I and mean, he's allowed a much more sort of 
anything goes kind of ethos. But but the fact is, the social media companies begin with the premise um, they're libertarian often, mm-hmm. um, and they you know. But we we're not going to be told what to do, and you know, kind of. Uh, but after a few years, they do tend to. And right now, on at least in the big ones, the Twitters, the Facebooks, etc., they have a uh, well. Let's leave aside Twitter, but I mean, some of the bigger social media companies have thousands of people pulling down extremist content that might inspire violence or incite violence, and um, and they also have um, you know kind of DNA uh, photo, uh, you know, photo DNA that you know, would take, would take down offensive videos or offensive photographs and they share that information mm-hmm. together. So that is, you know, one, but you mentioned this live streaming element. I mean, some of that, I think the Christchurch live stream, you know, it got out there and like millions of people, like it was copied and, you know, once it's out there, it can be hard to sort of pull it down, but there are things that can be done other than nothing. And, um, but it's, but it's a large problem. Yeah, and I think the Buffalo shooter was another one that was uh, live streaming or at least recording um, that incident as well. And I think that's one of the areas where we've really seen things pick up in recent years and has really been a, a way to to motivate others and, and create these copycats. Um, I mean, if you think of, a, you know, school shootings in the U.S., once Cal- Columbine happened, that's when we started to see all these copycats. Um, oh, yeah because of the coverage. And um, I remember I was I was in middle school at the time. And I remember having having threats at, at our school, too. And they were across, you know, across the country. Um, and I think that's something we're seeing now with a lot of these more live streaming attacks, too. Yeah. And of course, the Hamas attackers in Israel used GoPros and that mm-hmm. image that, that imagery got out there. Um, well, Tom, thanks very much for the discussion today um and um good luck with the book and uh and thank you for your time and your insights today appreciate it thank you everyone thank you thank you to the audience bye